Right, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with the last lecture on internal forced convection. We've actually, we've done all the theory, we've done, we have done some supplementary problems, but what I want to do now is two things. The one is I want to give you a sort of a road map or an overview so that you can better understand what is happening in the chapter, because sometimes you can get so lost in all the equations that are given that you do not see the bigger picture. So I would like to concentrate on the bigger picture and then I'm going to add a new perspective towards the work uh, which I've never seen before in a, in a heat transfer textbook and one day when I'm old and grey and maybe I don't have any, anything to do I will sit down and I will and I will write my own textbook, then I will add this part into, into this chapter on internal forced convection. Right, so internal forced convection, what is very important to realize is that with all internal forced convection problems can be reduced to either a problem of constant wall temperature, you've got a constant wall, so Ts is a constant or a constant heat flux. QS is a constant. So those are the two types of problems that we can get in terms of how heating or how cooling will occur. The constant wall temperature cases in industry will normally be heat exchanges in which you have boiling or evaporation. And that would be about 90% of all heat exchanges will actually fall into this category. So it's a very important category. It's a very, very effective type of heat exchanges and you'll see that later on when you do the chapter on heat exchanges. The other type of problem is where we've got a constant heat flux, so something is being heated and we put in a certain constant amount of heating continuously. And normally you can do it in mechanical engineering by putting in electrical energy, an electrical current through a body, a tube or something like that, or with a nuclear reaction. So both of them are very important to us as mechanical engineers. Right, now in the case of the constant wall temperature, then if we look at the temperatures if that is temperature as a function of x, then the surface temperature will remain constant. There it is schematically. And the fluid in which internal force convection occurs will typically, its behavior in terms of how the temperature increases as a function of x, will typically do something like this. This is the inlet temperature and that would be the outlet temperature. And what is important is that we've derived an equation that we can use to predict that temperature with. And that equation is the outlet temperature is equal to the inlet temperature minus the surface temperature minus the inlet temperature e to the minus NTU. And NTU is the number of transfer units. So the number of transfer units is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area for heat transfer divided by the mass flow rate and the CP. So that is the number of transfer units. And I've showed to you that if you've got an NTU value of 5, then it would mean that those two temperatures would actually be, for all practical purposes, be the same. So in industry, normally, red lights will go on when your NTUs starts becoming close to 2.5 to 3. Then already your heat exchanger will be very, very effective. Right, now the other thing that is very, very important is that, unlike the other case, the temperature doesn't increase linearly. So where previously we could have said that the heat transfer rate, okay, so previously we could have said that the heat transfer rate is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area 
multiplied by Ts minus Tb. We cannot do that. Okay. We cannot do it. Why? Because we can see that we've got an E to the minus in terms of the temperature distribution. So, for that reason, the LMTD approach was derived, the log mean temperature approach, in which we then say that the heat transfer rate is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area multiplied by LMTD. Okay. Okay, and the LMTD, <coughs> the LMTD, let me rather write it here. Okay, the LMTD is equal to this temperature difference, Ts minus Ti. Ts minus Ti minus this temperature difference, Ts minus Te. Ts minus Te divided by the lin of those two terms. And that would give us a very accurate description of the average temperature difference between the fluid stream and the wall. And that is actually also the temperature difference that you're going to use in all the heat exchanger applications that you're going to consider in chapter 13. Okay. So that is a very short summary of the constant wall temperature case. The other case is the constant heat flux. Now with the constant heat flux, if we look at the temperature as a function of x, if we have a stream with an inlet temperature, okay, and every one meter we put in one kilowatt, <laughs> every one meter one kilowatt, then the temperature is going to increase linearly. Okay, so that is very simple. So the temperature is going to do something like that, linear, and the wall temperature is going to do something like that. Okay, so from in this region, we have a constant temperature difference between this stream and the surface temperature. Uh, the, yeah, the surface, the surface. And this distance, from there on, the flow would be fully developed. And in this regime, the flow would be developing. Okay. And we have derived that the outlet temperature is equal to the inlet temperature plus the heat flux multiplied by the surface area divided by the mass flow rate and the Cp. Okay, and or we can calculate that the surface temperature is equal to the mean temperature, Tm, would be the mean temperature of the fluid somewhere, plus the heat flux divided by the heat transfer coefficient. Okay. So in the constant heat flux applications, it is very easy to see where the flow is developing and where it is fully developed. In these types of applications, it is not so, so obvious. Okay. Here it is very obvious. And why is the delta T here less? Because the heat transfer coefficient here is higher. The boundary layer is thicker. And because that is higher, the delta T here is smaller. And up to this point, from where on, the heat transfer coefficient is a constant. We will have a constant temperature difference between the surface and that of the fluid stream. So in general, all internal forced convection problems will fall into one of those two categories. Now that's the first thing that we need to know. The other thing that, that we now need to know is the fact that with all internal forced convection problems, the first thing that we sort of need to ask ourselves is, what is the Reynolds number? Because the Reynolds number is going to tell us if the flow is laminar or turbulent. 
So if it is a circular tube, we know it is 2,300 typically. Okay. And if it's more than 2,300, it would be turbulent. So the flow might be laminar or it might be turbulent. Okay. Right. Now if the flow is laminar, now then things are a little bit more complicated, then LH would be equal to 0.05 multiplied by the Reynolds number multiplied by the diameter. Right, so what would that now be? That would be if I, if I look at a tube, okay, and the fact that I'm drawing the tube here doesn't now mean it's the constant heat flux case, it is just in general. Okay, it would mean that that is the distance, how long it will take before the flow is fully developed. So that is LH. Okay. So it is equal to 0.05 multiplied by the Reynolds number multiplied by the diameter. And LT is how long will it take before it is thermally fully developed. That would be equal to 0.05 multiplied by the Reynolds number <coughs> multiplied by the diameter, multiplied by the Prandtl number. Okay? Right. Well, if the flow is turbulent, then LH would be 10 diameters, and LT will be 10 diameters. Okay, now I forgot to draw here the case of LT. So first, that is the velocity profile. LT would be the temperature profile. So how long will it take before the flow is fully developed in terms of temperature? Now in this case, I've drawn it on this side. So that is LT. Okay. Now LT will be larger than LH if the Prandtl number is larger than 1. <laughs> if the Prandtl number is smaller than 1, then it will be here. If the Prandtl number is equal to 1, then both of them would be at the same position. Okay. Right, now that is a very important thing to take into consideration because depending on what happens here, you need to take a decision in terms of is the flow developed firstly, let's call it TS and QS. So TS would obviously be for a constant wall temperature. QS would be a constant heat flux. Right. Now, if the flow is developing or fully developed, that will give you two different equations. The easiest ones is for fully developed. Okay. So, for example, if it is a circular tube and the wall temperature is constant, then the Nusselt number would be equal to 3.66. Okay. Well, if the tube is something like that, then the Nusselt number might be 2. So these tables available and people did analytical derivations in terms of how to develop these. Okay. And it is available in literature. But you have to remember, it is for fully developed flow. It doesn't include developing flow. Well, if it is a constant heat flux, then again, if it is a circular tube, then the Nusselt number is equal to 4.36. While if it is another type of geometry, like again, the triangle, then the Nusselt number is something like maybe 2.68, something different. Table 8.1, for example, in the textbook of Sengel, you can get some of these Nusselt numbers and friction factors for different types of geometries, and that is not all that is available in literature. You can go and look for the others. They are available. Okay. Right. So this is now the case for fully developed. If it is developing, then things become more complicated. 
then you have, for example, have to use the Edwards equation. Now the Edwards equation is in your textbook. Now the Edwards equation is a very nice equation because it would give you the average over the total length. So what this actually now means is that <coughs> for laminar flow specifically, so for laminar flow, we have this thing of where the flow is fully developed and where it is developing. Okay. And that you will have in any channel in any case. Okay, so if it is fully developed, then you've got this information. But you also need the developing part. So if, if it is a constant wall temperature, you can go and use the Edwards equation. And the Edwards equation, if this is may, maybe the total length, would give you the average over the total length. The other equation for constant heat flux we've given to you, the Shaw equation, that one is not so friendly. It will give you the heat transfer, the Nusselt number at the specific point. So you will have to go and calculate the Nusselt numbers and then do the integration to get the average. Okay. Right. Now what is very important is that with all the problems you actually have to use discretion. <laughs> okay. So you will have to look at the problem and see, well, my length is this, and I can ignore the developing part or not. If you can't ignore it, then you need to go and get the correct equations, and the textbook is not complete by far. It is just some of the most important ones which has been given to you. Okay. So that, in general, is an overview of internal forced convection. There are other complicating things, like, for example, if, the, if you have a, 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 maybe a, a tube, and now you put in enhanced areas that would enhance the heat transfer. And then there's also information in the textbook where we consider flow through an annulus. Okay, so the flow is now going through that part. And then there's a table which will give you the Nusselt number depending on the annulus ratio. Okay. And that in principle is the chapter on internal force convection. Do you have any questions in terms of the total overview? Oh, sorry, I actually forgot. I, I discover, I, I've discussed now the laminar flow cases but not turbulent. Turbulent is very easy. It is just 10 diameters. Now, I don't know of any practical applications where the total length is typically smaller than this. <laughs> so in 99% of the cases, if the flow is turbulent, you don't have to worry about the developing part. However, there might be exceptions where that is not the case, and then there are equations available in literature that can also take into consideration the developing part of the first 10 diameters. And then you need to take it into consideration when you calculate the average Nusselt number. Right, any questions? Nothing, okay. Let's look at something else that hasn't been discussed. And that is the case of what happens to the temperature if it flows through a geometry like a tube or a channel in terms of temperature where firstly there's no external heat transfer okay so there's no external heat transfer so the case that we are going to look at now is the case of a tube which is totally insulated So there's the insulation on the outside. And let's look at the first law of thermodynamics. The heat transfer rate plus the sum of the masses going in multiplied by the enthalpy in plus a half V1 square in plus GZI is equal to 
the sum of the masses flowing out multiplied by the enthalpy out plus a half times the velocity out plus gz out. Uh, plus the work, sorry, plus the work term. Okay, that's the first law of thermodynamics. You've all, you've all done your thermodynamics. Okay, now in this case, we've got no heat transfer. So I'm doing the problem now without heat transfer. Okay, and no work term also. There's no changes in height. Okay. The velocities are the same, inlet and outlet. Okay. So this problem reduces to the problem of the inlet enthalpy is equal to the outlet enthalpy. Do you agree? Okay. Now the inlet enthalpy, or the enthalpy we can write as U, U1 plus P1 multiplied by the specific volume is equal to U2 plus the pressure P2 multiplied by the specific volume V2. Okay. Let's get all the U's on the left hand side. U2 minus U1 is then equal to P1 V1 minus P2 V2. Okay. And now the internal energy we can write it as Cv multiplied by T2 minus T1 okay, is equal to the specific volume V multiplied by P2 minus P1 if we make the assumption that the flow is incompressible. Incompressible flow. Now what does incompressible flow mean? It means that the Mach number is typically smaller than 0.3. Now the Mach number, if you can't remember, you can go and calculate it, or no sorry, the speed of sound, C, is equal to the square root of KRT, and then you can go and calculate the Mach number as the velocity divided by C. Okay, so we are talking now of problems where the Mach number is smaller than 0.3. So, if we look at this, we, we can now see that we can write the temperature increase as P1 minus P2 divided by Cv multiplied by rho. Okay, so where am I going with this? I'm going, I'm asking the question now, if you've got flow through a pipe or a tube and we know there's going to be a pressure drop, what will happen with the temperature? Is there going to be an increase in temperature or not? Okay, so that is where I'm going, going to with this problem. Okay. Right, now <coughs> let's look at um, the pH diagram. If you go and look at the pH diagram, it looks something like that is a line of constant temperature, but what is very interesting is that these lines actually do something like that. So that is a line of temperature T2, and that would be the line of temperature T1. Right, and, now very important, is that we are working with a liquid, typically, okay, or it's not in, it's a single phase flow, okay, so it is not, it is not in the uh, two phase, two flow regime, so what we have here is that if we now look at what happens with the temperatures, we actually now have that, so that is 0.2, that is 0.1, and that is for a constant enthalpy process. So what does it show? It shows that if we have a pressure drop, 
okay? There's going to be an increase in temperature. And I think many of you would agree and, 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 and your expectation would have been the same. Do you agree with me? If you've got a long tube, I'm going to show you an example just now. You pump water or air through it, and there's a pressure drop, then those, the pressure drop they are, is because of frictions, there's shear forces on, 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 the, on the surface, and what happens with those energy which is being dissipated? It must go into an increase in temperature. You agree? Okay. But in most cases you will not feel it. Okay. So what is the reason for that? The reason for that is in terms of this ratio. If you look typically at air, at air, the CV multiplied by rho, case. CV of air is about 718. Density is approximately 1. So the order of magnitude of air, the, the ratio of CV multiplied by the density is about 1,000. Okay. While for water, okay, the CP is about... CV multiplied by rho. CV is about 4,000. That is 1,000. So you're talking of approximately a million. Okay. So if you now look at something which is being pumped through a tube, for the same pressure drop, for the same pressure drop, there will be quite, an, or the increase in temperature of the air will be much more than increase in temperature of the water. So that is what that thing sa says. Let's look at an example. An example of a pipe, 50 millimeters, so two inches, and let's start with a length of 100 meters and the velocity of five meters per second. And we look at water. Now, if you can lit look in literature of what would typically be the maximum velocities of flows through pipes, then there's not one single answer. Okay. But in general, if you're in industry and you work with a very experienced engineer and you would say, I've designed something in which the water flows at a velocity of 5 meters per second, you will immediately frown. It's high. Okay, so typically about 3 meters per second, something like that. It depends on the application. But generally about 5 meters per second is already very high. Okay, so let's look at the case of water. And with water, a density of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meters. The viscosity of 1 multiplied by 10 to the minus 3 kilograms meters per second, CV value of 4182, okay. comparison with air, then we're also going to do air, where we've got a density of approximately 1, a viscosity of 1 multiplied by 10 to the minus 5, and CV about 1007, uh, joules per kilogram Kelvin. Okay, so we're going to do the same problem with water and air, both 5 meters per second. Okay, now for a gas, 5 meters per second is not really high. You can, you can go high to higher velocities with a gas. Okay. Right, let's calculate the Reynolds number. So the Reynolds number is equal to rho VD divided by the viscosity. It's very elementary to do it. The density is 1,000. The velocity I've given as 5 meters per second. The tube diameter is 50 millimeters divided by the viscosity, which is 1 multiplied by 10 to the minus 3. So the Reynolds number is going to be 250,000. 250,000 Reynolds number.
from the Moody chart, we can, get, can go and get the friction factor. Okay, and this is a smooth tube. So it's a smooth tube, it's not even a rough tube, smooth tube, okay. And from the Moody chart, you can go and get the friction factor as 0.14955. I actually calculated it. Okay. And from that, we can get the pressure drop. And the pressure drop is equal to the friction factor multiplied by L divided by D multiplied by a half rho V squared divided by 2. Ugh. Just like that. The pressure drop is equal to the friction factor multiplied by L of D multiplied by rho V squared divided by 2. Okay. Now we've got everything. I'm not going to put it in here because I'm running out of space. The length is 100 meters. The diameter is 50 millimeters. We've got the density and we've got the velocity. Okay, you agree? You happy with that? So, from this we can calculate the pressure drop as 373 kPa. 373 kPa pressure drop. And now we can go and calculate delta T, which is equal to delta P divided by CV and rho. Okay, and the pressure drop is 373 kPa and CV is 4182 and density is 1000 and that gives us a temperature change of 0 0.08936 degrees Celsius. So you'll almost not be able to measure it. Very, very small. Okay, now let's do it for the air. Okay, so for the air, we can go and calculate the Reynolds number. Okay. So the density now is 1, the velocity is still 5, the diameter is still 50 millimeters, the viscosity now is 1 multiplied by 10 to the minus 5, and if we calculate the Reynolds number, it is now 12,500. With that new Reynolds number, and again on the Moody chart for a smooth tube, or you can do the calculations, then the friction factor F is equal to, uh, will be equal to 0 0.0296. Okay, and the pressure drop, the pressure drop would be 740 pascals, so it's much lower. Now, the delta T. So the delta T, if we go and calculate the delta T, is equal to 0 0.7348 degrees Celsius. And that you can definitely measure. It's almost a degree Celsius. Increase in temperature. Okay. So the changes are not significant. Do you agree? We can live with it in many cases. So if I ask you a heat transfer problem in the test or exam, and I've got a case like this, you can sort of forget about that, isn't it? Okay, however, <laughs> however, let's make the tube 100 meters, uh, uh, 1,000 meters. So a one kilometer tube. Okay, what happens now? The delta T of the water would be 0 0.89 degrees Celsius. So, no big problem, normally. Just an increase of about one degree Celsius. However, with the air, the temperature increase would be 7.3 degrees Celsius. Okay, so it's coming significant. <laughs> So I do not want to confuse you and so do not worry for the test or exam. I'm not going to put this part in it. I just want you to take note of it, remember about it. <laughs> and so the applications where you will have something like this, where just because of the flow, no external heat transfer, just because of the flow, there will be a significant increase in temperature. 
the applications are very, very small, very, very few in number. So normally that wouldn't, no, normally that would not happen, but always remember you've done thermodynamics for a reason. Okay, so in many cases it would, it would be the right thing to first go and calculate what would be the increase in temperature just because of the flow, and then you can go and add the increase in temperature because of the heat transfer, maybe an external heat transfer, or if it's cooling, then obviously you need to work the other way around to calculate your new temperatures. Okay, any questions, ladies and gentlemen? If not, thank you very much. Marlies, you can cut it. <laughs>